In 25 minutes on BBC One, the curtain goes up on the good old days with Bernie Clifton topping the bill. And now at nine o'clock, here's an extended news with Michael Burke. Casualties in Tuesday's landing in the Falklands. 59 men killed or missing, 74 wounded, says the Defence Ministry. Britain concedes there are 600 civilians in Port Stanley, says there's evidence some have been killed and agrees to a Red Cross safety zone. With troops poised for the final assault on Stanley, we've a report from our correspondent and confident words from the Defence Secretary. There is some way still to go, but the outcome is not in doubt. The ceasefire in Lebanon breaks down after less than a day. Israelis hit Palestinian targets in Beirut. King Khaled of Saudi Arabia dies. His brother takes over. Argentina kicks off the 1982 World Cup and are beaten. Good evening. The Defence Secretary, John Knott, tonight gave details of the British casualties during last week's Argentine air attacks on landing ships in the Falklands. 59 men died, 74 were injured. He said that the troops were now consolidating their positions after last Friday's surprise attack on Port Stanley and now hold Mount Longdon, Two Sisters and Mount Harriet, the high ground dominating the capital. 400 prisoners had been taken. But earlier in the week, during the attacks on landing ships in Bluff Cove and Fitzroy, Mr Knott disclosed that 43 soldiers of the Welsh Guards and supporting units were killed or are missing, presumed dead, and 46 were wounded. On HMS Sir Galahad, three officers and two crew died and 11 others were injured. On Sir Tristram, two members of the crew were killed. And in the course of the naval bombardment, the destroyer Glamorgan was hit. Nine of the ship's company were killed and 17 injured. At the Ministry tonight, Mr Knott explained why details of the casualties had been withheld until now. It was important for the success of the land operation that the Argentinians were not able to assess exactly when, how or in what strength we would attack. It is clear that the Argentinians greatly overestimated the extent of the casualties and damage resulting from their air attack on Sir Tristram and Sir Galahad on Tuesday. We wished them to remain uncertain about our strength on the ground and our capability to mount an early attack. None of this, of course, delayed the notification of next of kin, all of whom have been informed. Surprise was achieved in our operations and the progress made by British forces in their advance towards Port Stanley means that I can now give the official details of casualties from last Tuesday's attack. The news that the Welsh Guards escaped with moderate casualties from what could have been a major disaster means that 5 Brigade is still intact as a fighting unit. There had been fears that the Welsh Guards had been so severely mauled that they would have to be taken out of the front line. All the same, some of the wounded are seriously ill and that toll will probably rise slightly. The Defence Ministry have accepted Argentine reports that civilians have been killed in the latest fighting in Port Stanley, and they've been told by the International Red Cross that about 600 civilians are living in the town, three times as many as military intelligence had estimated. Most had probably come in for shelter and for food, and for the comfort of being with friends and neighbours, but these streets are now about to become a battlefield, and they could get caught in the crossfire. So the Red Cross have urged both sides to allow the civilians to shelter in a part of Stanley which can be clearly marked as out of bounds for use by Argentine troops and off limits for British fire. The most likely area seems to be the public buildings near the government jetty. The most important of these is the town hall, but there are also some soundly constructed stone-built houses. The trouble is they may already have been fortified by the Argentines and General Menendez may reject the Red Cross suggestion none of which is likely to affect the timing of the final British assault. Tonight, the commandos and paratroops are digging into what were until recently Argentine foxholes. Common sense says they can expect to receive an Argentine airstrike soon and probably an Argentine counterattack. Meanwhile, the Argentines have sent a protest note to Britain complaining about the civilian casualties in Port Stanley. They say two women were killed 
and four people injured. They also alleged that an Argentine hospital ship was attacked by British aircraft. From Buenos Aires, Clive Ferguson. The Argentine note refers to two incidents, both of which the government here say constitute grave violations of the Geneva Convention. Referring to yesterday's claim that Turk helpers had been killed and four injured during a British attack, the government here says Britain can hardly ask Argentina to be responsible for the protection of the civilian population when British forces bombed those same people they say they want to protect. They also say they find it hard to understand that having asked Argentina to allow the Red Cross to have access to Port Stanley, they then attacked the hospital ship carrying those same Red Cross personnel as it arrived in Port Stanley. The British attack on the high ground around Port Stanley was launched just after midnight on Friday, which was watched by Jeremy Hands, who sent this report on its successful outcome. It was a classic commando assault. As the big guns pounded the Argentine positions, something they'd become used to over the last few nights, Royal Marines and paratroopers silently moved in. Then at half past midnight, the so-called starting line was crossed simultaneously in three places as the British troops attacked the three key positions held by the enemy around Port Stanley. Each British attack was opposed by well-dug-in and well-supplied Argentine troops. We could see and hear the continual barrage of shells some aimed with deadly accuracy at the enemy strongholds, some thankfully less accurate coming towards us. The infantry battle raged throughout the night. In some cases, the British advances were held up by mortar fire, in other by machine guns and snipers, but the forward momentum was never lost. General Jeremy Moore was delighted with everyone's performance. We now have our lead positions exactly where the Argentine lead positions were until last night, he said, adding, there was some extremely good fighting by our young men with excellent support from the Royal Naval Bombardment and our artillery ashore. Before daylight, each of the three objectives was secured. British casualties had been remarkably light, but as yet it's been impossible to assess the Argentine losses, although initial reports are that they were heavy. There was no doubt, however, about the number of prisoners taken. By mid-afternoon, 340 Argentines had turned up, some of them considered to be most important. Others had surrendered from positions that weren't even being attacked. I saw some prisoners being brought in, blindfolded, arms tied behind their backs and dejected. And as I moved forward in the fresh, frosty sun of a midwinter morning, the extent of the British success and its importance became even clearer. Our troops, already in control of the important high ground around Port Stanley, now have secured positions from where they can control virtually all comings and goings from the island's capital. The three objectives were hard to take indeed, but the rewards are great. Stanley can no longer be regarded as a stronghold for the Argentines, merely a last refuge, which now lies at the mercy of the British guns and encircled by British troops. And as the grip on Stanley tightens, the more Argentine prisoners are seen woefully trudging back to the prisoner of warships, the mood of the Royal Marines and paratroopers with three commando brigade gets ever more buoyant. They've now not only seen action, but tasted victory in battle too. And while they know firsthand that the Argentine foe is not the pushover he'd been made out to be in some quarters, the British go into the next phase of the operation knowing that he can be beaten. The British forces then now command the heights overlooking Port Stanley, where, as we heard earlier, 600 Falkland Islanders still remain in grave danger now of being caught up in the final assault. John Cheek is a Falkland Islands councillor, knows the area around the capital well, knows too how the islanders might be reacting. Mr Cheek, what are your feelings after this latest news? More importantly, perhaps, how will the islanders themselves be reacting? I think we've been preparing ourselves for the fact there may be casualties. It was amazing we weren't at school screen. The island is obviously in Stanley very frightened, but I think looking forward to the British moving in as fast as possible. How is it that there were so many islanders in Port Stanley, two, perhaps even three times the original estimate of how many would have remained there? Yes, I think we at the office thought four to five hundred, but this is more than we'd thought. Obviously, people didn't want to leave their homes, understandably so. How much protection will there be if the battle is as fierce as, as is likely to be, as people are predicting? How much protection will there be in these buildings in the centre of the capital? Well, a lot of buildings are wooden, of course. Uh, there are some stone ones, and if this idea that the Red Cross have brought forward, that a certain area be designated uh, neutral, that may help. Uh, 
it surprises me the Argentinians blame the British for uh, uh, not, look, not taking care of the islanders when the Argentinians themselves seem to be moving in so the islanders in fact give them protection as it were. But 600 people is an awful lot of people. Will these buildings that are stone rather than wood contain them all and how much, you know, how thick are the walls? How, how much protection is there? I think there'll be protection, some protection against small arm fire, not against artillery. Um, the buildings that were mentioned earlier, the police station, the town hall and these other cottages in that area would take 600. It would be very cramped, but if it gives protection for, what, four or five days a week or whatever is required, then I think the people would like to go there. From your knowledge of the islanders, do you think the danger that they're now running, they'll consider it to be worth it if the Argentines are pushed out of the islands? Worth it to be free, yes. I think freedom does have its price. Unfortunately, and but I think they would like to be free again, yes. And the islanders would be prepared to pay that price? I would guess so. Obviously, I don't know. Mr. Cheek, thank you very much thank indeed. You. Two ships have arrived in Montevideo with men from both sides on their way home from the fighting. Sixty British wounded have been disembarked from the hospital ship Herald. Before that, more than a thousand Argentine prisoners finished the first leg of their journey in the converted ferry Norland. John Simpson reports. The ferry, which in normal times plies between Hull and the continent, was on the last stage of her curious voyage as a floating prisoner of war camp. But it took time. The Argentines wanted no publicity for the arrival here of the prison ship. And it was nearly dark when the Norland passed the converted ferry which was to take the prisoners home. Aboard, the Argentines were put to work cleaning up the ship. The great majority of them were in their teens. One was only 15. Several had been frostbitten before their capture, but the Red Cross found no great complaints about conditions on board. By morning, the Norland was on her way back to the islands. The Hull Ferry has never carried a stranger set of passengers, and there'll be more to come. On her way out, she passed the hospital ship Herald, with 60 British wounded aboard, the latest arrival in what the Navy now calls the Montevideo Run. Unlike the Norland's arrival, everything was out in the open. There are no great restrictions today about filming the Herald. There is, after all, nothing wrong from the British point of view about allowing people at home to see pictures of the wounded men being brought off. But Uruguayan caution still persists. The government here has ruled that there can be no interviews with anyone from the Herald, even though they can be filmed. The usual cheerfulness the prevailed, usual cheerfulness. though some of the men carried painful evidence of their wounds. And yet again, the cumbersome process of shuffling wounded men halfway across the world was working with remarkable smoothness. The Pope has returned to Rome after his two-day visit to Argentina. He said he'd continue to hope against every hope for peace in the Falklands. When the Pope left Buenos Aires, he repeated his prayer that he'd return one day. The Pope, who was seen off by President Galtieri, said he was happy with his welcome in Argentina, especially from young people. He said that his visit had been beautiful, but it wasn't enough. Back in Rome, the Pope told the crowd in St. Peter's Square that it was an illusion to believe that war and violence brought solutions. They brought only hatred and mistrust. He said he was deeply grieved by the fighting in Lebanon and prayed for peace there too. The fragile ceasefire in the Lebanon has broken down less than 24 hours after it came into force. Israeli jets and artillery have renewed their bombing and shelling of Palestinian guerrillas around Beirut's international airport, and just south of the city, the coastal port of Halda has come under fire. Each side blames the other for breaking the ceasefire. From Beirut, Chris Drake reports. It was mid-afternoon when the Israeli planes first went into action, dropping their bombs on a target close to the international airport. It was a raid which has badly shaken hopes that the latest ceasefire agreement will hold and prevent the clashes spreading into this densely populated city. Both sides have blamed each other for the ceasefire violations. However, the Israelis' use of planes has been taken here as lending weight to the Palestinians' claim that the invading forces are missing no opportunity to inflict the maximum damage on their positions.
casualty toll continues to rise, but even those who escape death or injury in the battle zones are badly affected. Over half a million are estimated to be homeless. Most have lost all their possessions, a large percentage have also had members of their families killed, and the battles are not over yet. Red Cross officials say hospitals are overcrowded with victims, there's a shortage of staff as well as medicine, and they describe the overall situation as extremely serious. There are reports of scores of bodies awaiting identification in the hospitals before they can be buried. Families with missing relatives have been carrying out the gruesome task of going through the wards and mortuaries searching for them. Southern Lebanon is now totally occupied by Israeli troops who've been consolidating their positions, promising the Lebanese that in future they'll protect them from PLO harassment. Christopher Morris reports from the area. In southern Lebanon, the guns may now be silent, but the hunt for PLO guerrillas goes relentlessly on. Everywhere, the white flags of neutrality flutter above Lebanese houses along the route of the Israeli advance. The more affluent refugees seek a way out at the many checkpoints, while the occupying Israeli forces suspect PLO terrorists are mingling with the refugees to try and escape. The wreckage of the PLO defeat litters the roadsides. The Israelis have penetrated far beyond their original 25-mile-deep invasion targets. Now, here in the south, with the ceasefire holding, they're consolidating their positions. Britain's Jewish community held a rally in the Royal Albert Hall today in which prayers were said for the recovery of Mr Shlomo Argov, the Israeli ambassador. The attempt on his life ten days ago was followed by Israel's invasion of Lebanon. Mr Argov was shot outside a London hotel and is still critically ill in hospital. Three Arabs have been charged with attempted murder. Francis Coverdale saw the rally. There was considerable security both inside and outside the Albert Hall. The police had been warned of a demonstration by the Palestine Solidarity Campaign. But the hundred protesters, many of whom have relatives in Lebanon, were orderly and presented no problem. Several thousand people attended the rally, called to condemn the shooting of Shlomo Argov and demand the closure of the PLO office in London. Beneath a huge poster of the ambassador, members of his family took their place on the platform. But his wife, Hava, who was due to speak at the rally, stayed away. Her son, Gideon, spoke instead. Also there, condemning the PLO and putting Israel's view of the attacks on Lebanon, the Israeli Deputy Foreign Minister. He'd been sent by Prime Minister Begin, especially for the rally. Our hearts beat together with yours in prayer for Shlomo's recovery. The ruler of Saudi Arabia, King Khaled, has died of a heart attack in the early hours of this morning. The king, who was 69, had been plagued by ill health for a number of years. His successor is his brother, Crown Prince Fahd, the man behind last year's Saudi peace plan for the Middle East. King Khaled was a conservative monarch who broke with tradition when he thought the interests of his country demanded it. Ultra-religious Saudis were offended when he welcomed a woman visitor, even if she was the queen. For King Khaled, it reaffirmed what he saw as a deep and continuing relationship with Britain. The West sees Saudi Arabia as a stable country in a troubled region, so there was some alarm when Muslim fundamentalists invaded the great mosque in Mecca and shot holes in the kingdom's tranquil reputation. It was a rebellion that was firmly suppressed. King Khaled saw Islam as a source of inspiration, both for his country and its dealings abroad. He came to London on a state visit, despite visibly failing health and Saudi anger over the ITV film Death of a Princess. For seven years, King Khaled ruled the world's top oil exporting country and was no mere figurehead. He wielded considerable influence in the Middle East and the wider international context. One man who knew him, the former Foreign Secretary, Lord Carrington. His assessment? Well, he was uh, um, a, a, very, a rather shy, retiring, moderate, sensible man who wielded a great deal of influence, not, I think, just because of his uh, position as king, but because of his own character. But he wasn't an extrovert in the way that uh, perhaps some of the others are. To what extent will you miss now in the Middle East? Well, I think any change in, this, in that sense uh, um, is, is, makes things difficult. There's obviously a change over period, but I think probably, um, in spite of King Hal's uh, very considerable qualities, in a sense, the Saudi Arabian government has been a, a much more of a sort of family, collective thing. And Prince Fahad, the 
Crown Prince and the Prime Minister, of course, has had an enormous uh, influence in foreign affairs, and uh, Prince Sultan and Prince Abdullah. I mean, there is a sort of collective leadership in a way, which I think you'll find there's a continuity. Tonight, less than seven hours after his death, King Khaled's body was taken back to Riyadh, wrapped in an Arabian carpet. Thousands of Saudis mourned the loss of their king, as did the rulers of neighboring Gulf states who'd flown in to be there. Later this year, Saudi Arabia is due to take a small step towards democracy with the creation of a consultative council. King Khaled had planned it. His successor is expected to carry it through. The 12th World Cup finals have begun in Spain. A colourful opening ceremony in a Barcelona stadium was followed by the first match of the competition between Argentina and Belgium. David Cass is in Barcelona. The magnificent 103,000-seat New Camp Stadium was almost full despite the absence of 10,000 Argentine supporters who failed to take up their World Cup booking. The spectacle and fireworks made it a proud moment for King Juan Carlos and Queen Sofia as they presided over their nation's greatest sporting spectacle. The whole hour-long ceremony was devoted to the theme of peace and harmony, from the Catalan folk dancing girls to the final tableau. Thousands of schoolboys making the shape of Picasso's famous dove of peace. What you haven't seen at home are several banners proclaiming Las Malvinas son Argentinas. The Falklands are Argentine, unfurled by fanatical fans of the world champions. These were quickly torn down by the stadium officials, and by the time the single white dove was released, the theme of peace was firmly established. There hasn't been a goal in the opening match of the World Cup for 20 years, but Belgium twice came close to ending that run. Belgium continued to press in the second half, and after 62 minutes, Van der Berg found himself free in the penalty area. 1-0 to Belgium, and the world champions were in trouble. With Argentina striving for the equaliser, Maradona struck a free kick from just outside the penalty area. That was the closest Argentina came to scoring, and the final score was Argentina nil, Belgium one. Northern Ireland's World Cup players flew out from Heathrow this evening, the last of the three home country's squads to arrive in Spain. Their first match isn't until Thursday when they play Yugoslavia, and they also face the host Spain and outsiders Honduras in their preliminary group. England's first game is on Wednesday, while Scotland opened their campaign on Tuesday. But the first match you can see on BBC One is the Group 6 clash between Brazil and the Soviet Union. The whole game can be seen live at 7.30 tomorrow evening. Jimmy Connors has won the Stella Artois Championships at Queen's Club. He beat the holder and number one seed, John McEnroe, 7-5, 6-3, to take the title and a cheque for £13,000. The Australian golfer Greg Norman won the Dunlop Masters at Chepstow for the second year running. He again equaled the court of 65 and came in 17 below par, eight strokes clear of the rest. And now the main points of the news in the Falklands conflict. The Defence Secretary, John Knott, has announced the casualties in last week's landing. 50 killed or missing, 57 injured. The destroyer Glamorgan was hit during the bombardment and nine crew members killed. British troops now control the high ground around Port Stanley, Mr. Knott says there's some way to go, but the outcome is in no doubt. It's now thought there are as many as 600 civilians in Port Stanley, and there's evidence some have been killed and injured in the British attack.